Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. It's been on everyone's mind, and today we're going to discuss this epic freeze we recently experienced and what it means to our plants. Becky Carroll joins us to talk about pruning pecan trees that were damaged in last fall's ice storm, while I show you how to get a new tree started in the right direction. There's no mistaking that we had a winter this year in Oklahoma. In fact, it was one of historic proportions. And unfortunately, when the snow finally melted, our landscape was looking a little browner than it was going into that snowstorm. Now we know here in Oklahoma that we range in cold hardiness zones from 6A to 8A for our plants. These are the zones we typically consider when we're buying plants and are trying to consider if it will survive our winters. At the far western edge of the panhandle, the hardiness zone is 6A, meaning the average annual extreme minimum temperature from 1976 through 2005 is negative 10 to negative 5 degrees Fahrenheit. Meanwhile, down in the opposite corner of the state, in southeastern Oklahoma, the cold hardiness zone is 8A, or 10 to 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Now for most of Oklahoma, we're in zone 7A and 7B, meaning we want our perennial plants to be able to survive winter temperatures as low as 0 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. If we look at the Oklahoma Mesonet site, we can look at the February summaries for any of the stations across our state. If you look at Oklahoma City, you can see that the temperatures were as cold as negative 6 one night and negative 15 the next night. This is well below what we typically expect our plants to survive. Furthermore, we remained below freezing for about 10 days straight. Kenton, Oklahoma, one of the coldest locations in the Panhandle, had a low of negative 22 again far below the average negative 10 degrees that is expected for zone 6a. Then going back to the other warmer corner, Idabel, Oklahoma dipped down to negative 5 about 15 to 20 degrees below their average cold temperatures. To give you a bit more perspective, these are the average annual lows for hardiness zones 5A and 5B in places like Iowa and Nebraska, but with one other difference. Those locations often have a snowfall to help insulate the ground and buffer it from temperature swings. Five days prior to this epic freeze, we had a high of 65, and about five days after, we were back up to 73 degrees. So going back to our question, what does this cold snap mean for our plants? Well, let me ask you another question. How many crepe myrtles do you see growing in Iowa and Nebraska? Unfortunately, the answer is not many. But really, the answer for our question here about our plant's health is we don't know just yet. For many of our plants, we're going to have to just wait and see. Now, obviously, this storm was very impactful and may be detrimental to many of our plants, but it's just a matter of time to wait and see. Obviously, a lot of our evergreens are now looking brown, and so we're going to have to check and see to, if they'll push out new growth. You can see on this particular deodor that we still have some greenery, um, but we're going to be watching some of those other buds to see if they push out new needles. It's sort of like when we watch our deciduous shrubs to see if they're going to push out new growth in spring, we'll also be watching some of our evergreens as well. It really depends on the health of the plant and the maturity of plant as it went into this cold snap. 
the hardier that root system, the more it will have energy to push out new growth. If it was already weak and potentially damaged going into this, then it might be a little bit more problematic. Now I suspect on some of our woody plants, such as crepe myrtles and nandinas, that they may have died back to the ground. This means that the upper vegetation above ground may have died, but the root system may still be viable. And if it's healthy and strong enough, it's gonna push up new growth. And the reason why it didn't freeze is because actually the ground insulated it a little bit. And if you look at our temperatures, while our ambient air temperature got well into the negatives, the soil temperature hovered around that freezing point. So what are some practical tips for assessing whether your plants have survived this winter freeze? Well, the first thing that I'm least concerned about are native plants. While they might not be used to those cold temperatures here in Oklahoma, a lot of our native plants have a range that's wider and can handle much of that cold weather. The plants I would be most concerned about are anything that is tender or newly planted going into this winter. I know that I often try to press the boundaries on some of those plants in hopes that they will overwinter. And a lot of times we get lucky and we may have been able to overwinter some of those tender plants for the last few years. But anything that was right there on the hardiness zone boundary probably has been taken out by this last freeze that we had, unfortunately. The next thing I would look at is the location and where that plant was located. For instance, in a raised bed, anything that's planted in a raised bed or a container is going to be more susceptible to that freezing temperatures, especially something like this that's an elevated table and does not have that ground insulation at all. In fact, that ambient air can go all the way around this planting bed. Now something like this, this uh, concrete container here that we've built, it at least has that ground heat uh, coming up and is not completely surrounded by ambient air. Now it is exposed on the walls, so again it is a little bit more at risk versus those plants that are actually planted in the ground. Now for some of our clumping plants that we tend to think of as being evergreens like this Nandina, what you might look at and see that it looks dead from a distance, but if you actually dig down into the center of it, you'll find that it overwintered just fine, that there's plenty of green still in there. Now this is probably gonna push out a lot of new growth this spring, um, and so you'll have to manage this dead uh, material on top just to keep it in a nice look, but it's gonna recover just fine. Now keep in mind, this is the time of year we often go through and clean up our garden, but we still have the chance of having a freeze until April 15th. Now chances are we won't have anything like we experienced in February. Now for some of our woody shrubs, you can do the scratch test. Now we've shown you this method before, but I'll go ahead and recap it. Basically what you're gonna do is actually scratch the bark um, down at the base of the plant. And you just wanna scratch it ever so slightly um, or kind of nick it. You can do it with a knife or your pruners. And what you'll do is you'll see actually some green cambium. If you see green cambium, then that means that this plant is actually still alive or this branch is still alive and viable. Now, some of these outer tips may actually be dead, but that's fine. As long as we know that there is some live vegetation still above ground, it will re-sprout from this. If you don't see anything, if it's actually brown and not green, then that means that that branch is dead. And you can check several of these branches on like your crepe myrtles and hollies and things like that. If all of them seem to be dead because you don't see any green cambium, then likely it has died back to the ground. Now that doesn't mean that your plant still won't recover. It just means that it's gonna have to re-sprout from those roots. So that means we're gonna have to give it some more time to really see when it re-sprouts and allow those soil temperatures to warm up. So there's still some hope. Now, hollies and crepe myrtles, they regrow pretty quickly. So depending on your time and your patience and also your budget, you might have to evaluate those factors as to whether you want to wait for it to regrow and gain that size back or you want to go ahead and replant. Now on larger woody plants, such as some of our live oaks and our deodores, it might be harder to do a scratch test at the base of that trunk just because of the hard bark that's there. 
What you can do is you can sort of uh, do some of the scratch tests on some of the younger branches to see if they're still viable or again just give it some time and wait to see if it pushes out new leaves. Finally, I know it's been a challenging year. After a catastrophic early ice storm in October and now record-breaking freezes in February, unfortunately there's not one answer to weathering all of these storms. But that's why diversity in the garden is important. And if you do lose a plant, that just means there's opportunity to add something new. For more information, check out this fact sheet. Today we're back at the Cimarron Valley Research Station just north of Perkins and we're taking a look at how cleanup is progressing after the uh, late October ice storm that we had. Uh, we had probably about an inch of ice build up on some of our trees and at that time, it was, it was October 26th and 27th I believe, um, the trees had fully uh, a full canopy of leaves and most of them were covered with a full crop of pecans. And so you can see just from behind me, some of our trees didn't fare too well. And we're going to talk about some of the decisions that we might make as we're deciding how to clean up this damage and, and if it's worth saving the tree also. This tree is a Giles cultivar. And Giles has a weeping growth habit, and it was fully loaded with, with the cons. You can see that there's, there's still some hanging in the, the branches here, so we didn't get to harvest these trees this year. And uh, the crows and, and other critters are really happy about that because they're uh, getting really stocked up for the winter. But uh, you can see this tree, it's lost every branch on this tree and so when we have exposed wood where they're split like that those are areas that we need to remove it's just opened up for disease and things now in a commercial setting it's not always possible to do all of that cleanup but for um, for small area then we want to go in and do some of these cuts and decide what's what's fixable and what we need to just get rid of now since this is Giles, and it's not a cultivar that we really recommend uh, for, for quality production, it makes a great uh, nut to use for rootstock pr production. It's a cold hardy rootstock that we can grow from the seeds, but we have other Giles in another location in the orchard. But you can see since this limb er, has split off, it's split down into the trunk you know, at over four feet high is where we'd have to, um, or it'd be about four feet where we'd have to cut this off. So this tree is just going to be pushed out and removed. It's not really needed for research right now. We don't need the nut production off of this tree, and it's so damaged that we really just don't want to put the time and effort into trying to retrain it. Now some growers do go in and cut them back like a telephone pole, let them re-sprout, and grow back but it takes a little bit more time and more management because you're going to have to do more training on that tree to try to get to a central leader structure. We'll take a look at some of the trees in the orchard that were uh, had more of a central leader structure that usually makes a stronger tree than a modified leader or, or mini leaders in the top of the tree. When you have one straight leader in the top of the tree it makes a stronger tree. But even this year with as much ice and leaves and nuts, a central leader would not save your, your pecan tree. Now just south a few rows of, of these giles, we have Merrimack trees. 
and they have very little damage, just some minor branches in the top of the tree that are broken out. It, the Merrimack is, um, it's just a little bit stronger uh, growth habit in a stronger wooded tree. So we had a lot of differences in how each of the cultivars withstood the damage, but a lot of it had to do with our excess of leaf load and our crop that was still on the tree at this time of the year. It's just extremely early type of a ice storm event. So some of the trees didn't have as much damage and a homeowner might be able to do some of the trimming up and the, the repair by themselves, but always make sure that you're properly you know, geared up with all your safety equipment. Use a pole saw. Don't try to get on a ladder to do any kind of, of pruning uh, with, a, with a chainsaw or a pole saw. But from the ground, we can remove uh, this limb that has split off. And so since this limb is coming from an area that it's a little bit of a narrow crotch angle, it makes it a little bit of a weak structure anyway, we're gonna remove that branch all the way back to um, to the, to the trunk area. We're gonna cut it above that, that uh, collar area so it will heal over nicely. But we can remove this limb from the ground. And then you might see there's a couple of limbs that are broken up higher in the tree. We're just gonna leave those. And it will naturally go ahead and, and fall out with wind later. So you need to be careful if there's big limbs that are loose up in the top of the canopy but we're not gonna try to get up there and try to remove those ourselves. We're gonna either, if you really don't like it, if it's too unsightly, you could hire someone to come in and do that, but it's really not gonna be a, too much of a detriment to this tree. We're gonna just remove this one broken branch right now. So in other areas of the orchard, we had more damage and uh, not as bad as those giles where they split all the way back, but we did have some of these trees uh, lose major limbs. But in this tree, we're going to use a lift uh, or a bucket lift to get up into the top of the tree and remove some of those split out uh, branches up in the top of the tree. And we'll also maybe do some pruning to remove some bad crotch angles while up doing those, those prunings. And um, people can rent a bucket lift. Like this one's pretty massive, but there are smaller ones you can rent. But I just wanna caution you, if you are thinking about doing pruning yourself from an elevated surface, make sure you have some type of safety training and, and be fully equipped with all of the gear. And, and you can see when, when Trevor's up in the bucket, he has got on a harness and hard hat and ear protection, and he's fully geared up for, uh, for safety. And um, because, you know, these trees are, are important, but we wanna keep our people safe. And this is a kind of a dangerous job, so we wanna do it as, as carefully as possible. Now, on some of these limbs, um, you can see that where they're split, that opens it up and can, in a lot of instances, there's not, um, we don't worry about disease that much. But uh, Jen Olson, our diagnostic uh, diagnostician from the, the Plant Disease Insect Lab, she was saying that there are some new uh, diseases that may be coming in to other types of trees that we may see in some of these situations where we haven't in the past. And so we're gonna try to remove as many of those splits and tears on the bark just to get them cleaned up. Now in a commercial orchard where they have acres and acres of trees, may not be possible to do that, but they need to keep an eye out for any type of, of limbs that are dying back later in the season. Also on, on the orchard, we're gonna reduce our fertilizer this upcoming season because we don't want the trees to grow too much. We want them to grow slowly in recovery, but we may have to kind of play with it a little bit to see if we get the right amount of fertilizer to get good growth, but not excessive. Another thing that we're really gonna watch is we're gonna apply zinc uh, applications, a foliar application starting at bud break and then every two weeks. And normally on mature trees, we would stop after about three applications. But when we have severe limb injury or we've cut them back severely and they're growing new wood, 
we may keep those zinc applications going until the end of June or the, even till the middle of July to cover those, those leaves with zinc. Zinc helps with uh, leaf expansion and size, and if we get better leaf production, uh, more leaves, that's just going to feed that tree and get it to grow healthier and, and back into production quicker. Some of these more severely damaged trees may take three to five years to get back into production, but a tree like this, it's still going to have good production. We may lose a little bit just because we're pruning it back some, but we're not going to lose too much production on a tree like this. Now some that we'll show you in a minute, it may take about three to five years to start producing again. So this part of the orchard has been pruned back um, already and cleaned up. So you can see the orchard floor is pretty, pretty clean. There's a few branches that may still be falling out. But um, some of the trees are cut back pretty severely. And we've cut major branches uh, back. So some of them are just kind of stubs up there. But we're going to watch these trees, um, how they're regrowing back. Some of them still have a few branches that may have a little bit of production in them, but uh, some of the other branches uh, will take a while. Now, this time of this, the year, we could come back in here and do some more pruning to get some better crotch angles, take off a few little stubs here and there, but we're just trying to get through the orchard once right now and get it cleaned up. We can come back and make some more final decisions a little bit later. But we'll, we'll revisit the orchard later in the season and see how the trees are growing back and, and progressing. And we'll, uh, we'll follow along with the progress here on Oklahoma Gardening. today about uh, staking our trees. A lot of times when we buy new trees out of the nursery they come with a pretty flimsy small bamboo stake and you can see um, how that is very narrow in diameter and not very tall at all. Now this lasted probably for one season. I had it staking up this Arizona cypress that it came with and what I like to use is just pantyhose to kind of um, pull against that tree so that it's not really binding on that tree and it allows for some flexibility. One thing when you're staking trees you want to make sure that there is some flexibility because you've got to allow that tree to build up its own diameter and its own strength. I always kind of say it's like abs and if you're constantly supporting it then it's not going to build that own uh, structure um, to support itself once those stakes come off. So you want to allow for some flexibility. But you can see that stake is about the same size as the tree is at this point. So we're going to come in with something bigger now. You can see this is a bamboo stake that's got much more uh, girth to it and also a lot taller. Um, and it's just going to really allow us to hold up this tree much better. Now we get a lot of southern wind here, so I'm really only looking at staking it on the south side. Um, if you were concerned about winds from all over, you really want to stake it at least in two directions, if not three in some situations. You could use a T-post also if you wanted to, but I've got these bamboo poles that I'm going to use. Um, and another thing I want to point out before I get this staked, and a reason why I'm really wanting to stake this too, not only to help support the tree, but if you look in close here, you can see when this tree was purchased, um, it lost its top initial leader right there. So at some point this leader has died and so what we're trying to do is to allow this side shoot to become its new leader, which it will do. It'll develop into that. So um, we just want to make sure that it maintains the top uh, and, and reaches for the sun. So we're going to put this stake on the south side, pulling that tree back up. So there you can see we've staked it on the south side to really help compensate for those southern winds that we're getting. And it's gonna, you can see it's got some movement to it and we want that movement. 
Um, I've retied the pantyhose just a little to allow for some more flexibility and also to make sure that it's not uh, wearing on the tree trunk. You always want to make sure that um, that can cause damage within one growing season. So make sure if you haven't checked any trees that are currently staked that you go ahead and check them again. Typically a tree only really needs to be staked for a year or so. So um, make sure that you're checking though each season that there's not any wear or damage on that tree and loosen it if necessary. At this point our tree is staked and it should be good for another season. There are a lot of great horticulture activities this time of year. Be sure and consider some of these events in the weeks ahead. Next week on Oklahoma Gardening, I'll show you the first thing everyone needs to do in their garden this spring. We revisit a tree project that has been tabled for a while and take a closer look at a couple of kits for the novice gardener. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club.